let's please welcome Brother Poole at this time. Praise God. Well, it's a blessing to be here. Stand with me for a moment. Put your hands on your eyes. Say, Lord, open my eyes that I can see what you have for me. Put your hands on your ears. Lord, open my ears that I can hear what you have to say today. Now put your hand on your heart. Father, give me a heart to receive from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's important that we understand, you know, the scripture tells us that we have, Jesus says there's many, if you, for example, he'll say, if you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit's saying. Well, we know we all have ears, but not everyone is hearing what the Spirit's saying because their spiritual ears may be dull or their spiritual eyes may be dim. So we need to always pray that God would open our eyes, open our ears to hear what he has to say. You know, anybody can get up and speak, but listening in the midst of that, you'll hear the Spirit of God speak. And only he brings life. Amen? Only the Spirit of God brings life. And uh, I can maybe make you laugh or make you feel good, but the Spirit of God can bring life. He can energize you. He can cause you to feel like you're ten times bigger on the outside, on the inside than you are on the outside. Amen? So, um, tell you a little bit about myself. I uh, live in Shiner and uh, just a member of Trinity Church there in Quero and minister there uh, as needed. And um, I've been was born again, got saved in a jail in 1985 in Lano, Texas. Little, little bitty jail and uh, got filled with the Spirit of God there. The, there was a jailer. God, God actually set the whole thing up for me because um, I was in bondage to, to alcohol and whatever else I was in bondage to. And um, I, I had a close friend tell me, she said, it was a girlfriend of mine, and she told me, she said, if you're going to continue to come around my house drunk, I would prefer you not to come anymore. And I knew that she cared about me. And, and so, because I knew she cared, it really touched my heart. You know, the scripture tells us, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I will come in. You have to have an open door for your words to really do anything in an individual's life. If, you've, if you go and you blast them and you tell them what a sorry individual they are, you've closed, your heart, you've closed their heart. So whatever you have to say from that point on, it's just going to bounce off. So she understood that and she came in humility and she said, you know, I really care about you, but if you're going to be drinking and, and drunk like this when you come around, please don't come around anymore. And so I really began to cry out to God at that point. I knew about God. I had been raised up to about 10 years of age in a Baptist church. And um, I didn't, didn't have a lot of understanding about the Word, but I did know about God and believe in God. And so, but you know, the devil does too, so it doesn't do us a lot of good just to believe. We, if, we, if we believe that it's true that there is a heaven and a hell, we need to do something to uh, allow him to bring change in our lives and alignment to do what he's called us to do as, a, as an individual as well as a corporate body. But I, I uh, began to cry out to God and I said, uh, you know, the thing was, I decided, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore. And so I would go in the store at the end of the day and uh, decide I'm going to go in there and get me an orange soda. And the next thing I know, I'm coming out with a 12-pack of Budweiser. And I, I really wanted to quit it. And I would lay on my bed at night and I would cry and I'd say, God, you've got to help me because 
I don't like living like this. I don't like being uh, this type of individual. And so I began to cry out to God, and I didn't know he was going to put me in jail. I would have probably said, you know, I'll just keep going like I'm going. But I ended up in, in this county jail, and uh, I, I was, I was um, very clever, I guess you could say. I could lie my way out of things. Um, just, uh, I, I could be on probation in two or three different counties at the same time. Because I would tell them, no, I've never been in trouble before. So, the, you know, this was back before they had all the computers and everything now where they can track you. But, but I mean, there was times I was in probation in Harris County and, and Fort Bend County and get a DWI in, in Williamson County. And they never even know. And be reporting to the probation officer by mail while I'm in jail. I mean, I, I, I thought I had this figured out, you know. And, and I did, but it was catching up with me. And so, uh, I got out of jail in Williamson County and actually went to Harris County, reported my last time, and the probation officer said, son, I'm, I'm very proud of you. You're one of the few. And I was like, well, I try, I try. <laughs> you know, I try to hide from y'all. <laughs> but that was just my lifestyle. And, and uh, my oldest brother was a police officer, and my middle brother, we were kind of like outlaws, and we favored a lot. So when my license would get suspended, well, I would just give them my brother's name and date of birth, and, and uh, they'd write, write him a ticket and go on about my business. And so, uh, I mean, honestly, I, I just didn't have a care in the world. I just, I really, I figured I'm going to hell. I might as well enjoy it. That was, that was my mindset. And so, but when I began to cry out to God, I ended up in this little jail in Llano County, Texas. And uh, I got out and went and reported to my probation officer in Williamson County. And he said, how's everything going? I said, everything's going good. And so he said, well, what about this uh, DWI in Llano County? I said, oh, that's just a mistake. That, that's, that's been cleared up. You know, I thought, if he lets me out of this office, I'm not coming back. And so he said, um, well, what about the unauthorized use of a motor vehicle? I said, yeah, that's all cleared up. So he said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to check this out because they're coming to take you to jail right now until we get it all cleared up. So I said, well, if I'm going to jail, I might as well tell you the truth. Yeah, I stole a truck, and I got another DWI. And so anyway... But, but see, I would, I would think ahead and try to plan, and I knew how the courts reflected on things. I knew how they looked. So what I did is while I was out on bond, I went and I committed myself to one of those rehab centers. And I said, you know, this will look good in court that I'm trying to get myself straight. Now, I really wasn't at the time, but I committed myself to one of those rehab centers. And so my probation officer, so I'm telling him, I said, honestly, I said, I got a problem. You know, I'm, I'm just lying like a dog to him. I said, honestly, I've got a problem with drinking. And I said, I went and committed myself to one of these rehab centers. So that really kind of, his ears perked up. And he said, well, you know what? I'm glad you did that. And he said, uh, I'm not going to hold you without bond. We're going to let you get back out. And I'd like to see you go ahead and continue through the rehab. So I was like, okay. But God had another plan. Everybody say, but God. So God had another plan. And uh, he had heard my cries that I needed deliverance from this stuff. And so uh, when they put me in jail in Williamson County, now Lano County, when they indicted me, they raised my bond and they reissued a warrant for me. And so I'm sitting in jail in Williamson County and they've got a court date for me in Llano County. So they didn't notify Llano County that I was incarcerated, so I missed my court date. So now Llano County has a warrant for me, and they're not going to give me a bond. So finally, Williamson County catches on that, we, that, that Llano County is waiting for me. They transfer me, and I sat there and I spent Thanksgiving, I spent Christmas, New Year's rolled around, People were getting put in jail and getting back out and getting back in jail, and I still haven't gone to court. 
So I, I said to the jailer, I said, you know, I don't understand this, this process that y'all have here. And so she said, well, let me check. So she called and they said, well, we have a warrant out for him. When he's arrested, we will we'll take him to court. She said, he's been here for several months, incarcerated. So they took me to, took me to court. But the thing that I want you to understand is God set that thing up. He was the one that worked it out to where I couldn't get back out because he knew if I got back out, I would go right back to my old habits. And so when they put me back in there and I spent Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, the jailer, the, the deputy that arrested me was a Christian. And he said, son, I'm going to tell you what, we had an Uzi machine gun on you and if you would have made one wrong move, I'd have blown your brains out. And I told him, I said, you know what, I wished you would have because I'm tired of living like this. So when he saw my heart, he, he then had an attitude change and he gave me a Bible when I got to jail and... You know, he, he turned Christian on me all of a sudden when he saw my heart. You know, we can kind of have, have attitudes like that sometimes. And so, uh, his wife was a jailer there, and, and she smoked. And uh, so, you know, I'm thinking, if you're going to serve God, serve him 100%. If you're going to serve the devil, serve him 100%. You know, he said, I would rather you either hot or cold. He didn't, he didn't care for the lukewarm. So I was like, I couldn't understand people that were, were considered to be Christians and serving God and, and drinking and smoking, and, and you couldn't tell the difference in, between them and the world. And so anyway, I was glad that this lady was a Christian, you know, and she, she kind of encouraged me somewhat. And, and I really became good friends with her and her husband. But... Uh, there was a ministry team that came there, and there was a jailer there named Joe Treyweek. And Joe really began to take interest in me, and he would buy books and bring to me Christian books by Kenneth Hagin and Charles Capps and, and men of God like that. And so he brought me one on the Bible way to receive the Holy Spirit. And so I just cried out to God, and I said, uh, God, you know, in the Baptist church, I remember the only thing that I even remember about the Holy Ghost was there was a couple that got kicked out of church for speaking in tongues. And so I said, you know, they said this is not for today. I, I remembered that. It was like, I was about nine or ten years old, but it was a very traumatic event in my life, I guess, to hear that they kicked this godly couple out of church because they got filled. They went to the little Pentecostal church and got filled with the Holy Ghost, and they came back, and they said, you're, you're not welcome here anymore. And so that was the only recollection I had of anything about tongues, the Holy Ghost, or any of that. And so I read this book, and I seen, you know, when, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will receive power from on high. And I was like, that sounds like what I need. Because I've been trying to quit and I can't quit. I've been trying to do these things and I haven't been able to do them. So I said, God, if this is still for today, if the, if the Holy Ghost is still for today, and, and you're willing, I want your spirit. I want the Holy Ghost. And so the, the, I just opened my mouth and I said, la da da shah, la da da shah. And it didn't mean anything to me. And I, in my natural mind, I'm just thinking that was just gibberish. And so Joe, the jailer, he comes in the next day. And I didn't know, but Joe's at home making intercession for me. He's praying for me that I'll get baptized in the Holy Ghost. So he come in the next morning and I had my head covered. It was just me and another guy in the bunk. Lano was not very big jail, so Lano County. So I had my head covered, and I heard him talking to the other guy. He said, do you know if Rocky got filled with the Holy Ghost last night? And he said, well, I'm not sure. He said, but I heard him making some funny noises. <laughs> so a little bit later, I got up, and Joe come back, and he said, did you get filled with the Holy Spirit last night? I said, well, Joe, I believe I did, but I'm not sure. I said, I, I, all I said was la da da sha, la da da sha. He said, that's it, that's it. He said, you just let it flow, just let it flow. So I did, and I began to let it flow, and the, as I would just become uh, yielded to the Spirit of God, and the tongues would just begin to flow, tears would just begin to stream down my face. And I wasn't sad, but it was just the Spirit of God within me weeping. There was, a, there was a, a, something taking place that the natural man was unaware of. And so God uh, 
changed my life in that little county jail. Filled me with the Spirit, delivered me from the alcohol and from all of the other things that I was interested in. And uh, I just began to have a passion. And I, I knew that I had a call on my life. When I was in the third grade, the teacher would, you know, she said, okay, we're going to talk to everybody today and find out what you want to be when you grow up. And so she asked, you know, each individual what you want to be. And they're going, well, as soon as she said that, I heard in my spirit, you're going to be a pastor. But, you know, I was very shy and timid, so I kind of didn't want to say anything to, in front of the, the other kids, you know, and they say, a preacher, you know, make fun of me or something. So I just, I, just, I enjoyed mechanic work, so I said, I'm going to be a mechanic. But I know that day I heard the Spirit of God just as clear as anything say, you're going to be a preacher. And so I knew that I had the call of God on my life, but you know in the Baptist church, we would have these ministers come through and they would preach about this terrible life that they had, this terrible life that they lived, and then God saved them out of that. And now they're preaching the gospel. And I thought, you know, it was like instilled in the back of my mind, you've got to live an ugly life first in order to really be a good preacher. So I guess in the back of my mind, subconsciously, I was trying to live that life that I thought you had to live in order to be a good preacher. And so, anyway, the, the, the enemy's very clever at his tactics and his strategies in our life. And uh, so, uh, I've just been running with God ever since. Uh, we, we know that we have obstacles in our path. We always have opposition as, a, as the body. Uh, it's just part of uh, our lives here on the earth, and uh, everything that we go through, it'll make us stronger. It'll either make you bitter or better. It's your decision. And so I've just choose to let things make me better. Some things are hard to get past. Some things get lodged in the emotions, and it's hard to shake them and get free from that. But I am thankful for the anointing of God that's able to destroy every yoke and remove every burden and set us free. Amen? Praise God. Uh, just so that we can be legal and go with the scripture today, I'm going to share Hebrews 11.6, which just simply tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. The only way that you're going to please God is when you step out in the unknown and you begin to do things that you haven't done before. It doesn't take faith to do what you've done before. It takes faith to do what you've not done before. It takes faith for you to go places that you've never gone, to say things you've never said, to see things you've never seen. And the only thing that hinders you and keeps you back from that is between your ears, between these two ears. That's the only thing that hinders you and keeps you from moving into what God has in store for you. And so I only have a 10th grade education. I quit school in the 10th grade so I could start this career of being a, a terrible person before I became a Christian. And, um, and so I uh, never even went and got my GED, never, never did any of that. But I have lived a life of faith. God has, God has just done supernatural things. Um, you know... Even though you, when Llano County ended up, uh, well, Williamson County actually, in 1986, uh, I, I want to go back and finish telling you this story. I got saved in that little county jail, and God began to just download revelations into me and things and, and get me prepared for when I got out. And so uh, when I went to court, the judge said, uh, do you have an attorney? You know, they ask everybody if you have an attorney. And I said, well, my, my boss is supposed to have hired me an attorney, but I haven't met him yet. And he said, you have a job. And I said, yes, sir, I have a job, but you have been holding me without bond for several months. And I said, so I can't get out to work. And I explained to him what was going on. And he said, if what you're telling me is the truth, I'm going to let you back out on your original bond. And you can go to work and get your own attorney. And I said, okay. So they put me back in the cell, and then they come back the next day and took me back to court. And he said, what you told me is the truth. And he said, I'm going to let you back out on your original bond. And he handed me a card 
from an attorney, and he said, this attorney, this attorney said, give him a call. He would be glad to represent you. Now, Williamson County is another story because that's, I had gotten a DWI there. I had gotten an aggravated assault on a police officer because I tried to knock the police officer out so I could jump in the car and get away. I'd give him my brother's name that night, too, so they would have, he wouldn't have been happy if they had come knocking on his door. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, so I'm in Lano, uh, Williamson County, going back to Williamson County to go to court, and, and, and uh, this attorney tells me, I called him, and he said, I get everything in Lano County dismissed. Now, remember, I had a felony unauthorized use of a motor vehicle and a felony DWI in Lano County. And he says, I can get all that dismissed, and I'll get your probation reinstated in Williamson County, and you can just finish this thing out. And he said, for, for $2,500. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good deal, you know. So I said, okay. So then he comes back, and he says, well, Williamson County is a little bit upset with you, you know, because you hit that police officer, and, and, and uh, so they want to extend your probation 10 years. And he said, now I can do this. He said, I can still get everything in Lano County dismissed, and I can get you two years in TDC, Texas Department of Corrections. It's called Texas Criminal Justice or whatever now, Department of Criminal Justice. But he said, you can, you've already got enough time served. He said, you'll go down, you'll get your number, and you'll be out and have all this behind you, or you can take the 10 years probation. I said, I'll go down there and get my number and, and get out. And so... But I said, but how are you going to get me off of this stuff in uh, uh, Lano County? He said, my wife's the district attorney. <laughs> so the thing is, God had everything set up for me. And everything in Lano County was wiped out. And actually, the arresting officer and his wife, who was a jailer, came to court with me in Williamson County and testified in my behalf because they saw the change. They actually, while I was still incarcerated, they, came, they saw the change and they said, if we are willing to come and take you out of jail to go speak to youth groups, would you be willing to do that? And I said, sure. So... God just began to work miraculously in my life. I ended up going to TDC, and, and I had actually put down the parole to this police officer and his wife. They said I could parole to them. But they moved, and so uh, that messed me up on where I was going to be able to parole to. So I get to the unit, and they said, I said, now I need to get my parole paperwork changed because I cannot... Uh, I can't, I, there's, there's no way that I can get this, um, I mean, there's no way I can get out until I get my paperwork changed because this person moved. And so, and they had actually already contacted the police officer, and I mean, as soon as I got there, I, was, I got my number, and they were going to let me back out. But now I'm delayed. Everybody say delayed. So now I've been delayed, and so I, I go to the captain of the ward where I'm at, and I said, listen, I need to do whatever I need to do to get this paperwork changed. And, I, and he said, you have to go through the unit counselor. And he said, son, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be in here for months. He said, because it's a process. And he said, it's, it's not, you know, it's like six weeks before you can even see this unit counselor. And so I said, okay, uh, I need the paperwork. So I got the paperwork and I filled it out. And I said, what? I asked him, I said, what if I write Austin? He said, Austin has nothing to do with you getting out of here. You must go through this unit counselor. And so I said, okay. Well, it wasn't that I wanted out so bad, but it was that I knew in my spirit it was time to get out. I knew that God had done what he wanted to do while I was there, and it was just simply time to get out. So I went back to my cell and I prayed, and I said, Lord, you said in your word that about midnight, Paul and Silas began to sing praises and the prison was shaken and you let them out. And I said, so I'm not asking you to shake this jail and break the walls because they're going to come looking for me, but I am asking you to shake this thing and get me out of here. And so I said,
Thank you. Like a little kid, I drew a map on this piece of paper and, and wrote the name of the person I was going to parole to. And I laid hands on that letter and I said, God, you have angels that can carry this letter and put it in the hand of an individual that will do something with it. That will put it not in the trash can, but will open it up and file this paperwork and, and get me out of here. And I said, now I'm, I'm asking you, Lord, I'm going to send this out. And I'm asking you, have me out of here in 10 days from the day I mail this letter. So I laid hands on it, released the anointing of God into it, put it in the mail. Three days went by and I began to tell everybody was in a big dorm like unit there and I began to tell everybody I said I'm going home this week and they said how do you know I said because I prayed and I asked God <laughs> and they're like oh man get out of here you're crazy and so but you know here's the thing I want you to understand about faith you have to get the vision on the inside bigger than the opposition on the outside until the vision on the inside gets bigger than whatever opposes you, you'll never do anything for God. Are you hearing me? The vision on the inside, what you're believing God to do, has got to be bigger than all of the opposition that comes against you. And the way that you do that is stop focusing on the opposition, but begin to focus on the one who's able to deal with the opposition. So I focused on Jesus, and I walked around telling him, Lord, I thank you that, you know, within seven days, I'm going to be out of here now. And then the next day, it rolled around. Within six days, I'm going to be out of here now. And I'm telling the guys, you know, because faith speaks. Amen. Faith has something to say. So I'm going through there, and I'm declaring that I'm going to be out this week. And so I had sat down on a bunk next to this little Spanish guy, and I was talking to him, and I said, hey, man, I'm going home this week. And he said, how do you know? And I told him the story. I said, because I've been praying, and oh, man, you're crazy. And while I was sitting there on the bunk talking to him, a trustee said, hey, Poole, come here, come here. And, and he worked in the officer's ward, and, he, and I went over, and he said, guess what? I said, I'm going home. He said, how did you know? I said, because I prayed and I asked God to have me out of here in 10 days, and I'm down to my last six days, so I know I've got to go home in the next six days. He said, you're leaving tomorrow. And so the vision on the inside, see, I got in the Word, and I began to see that God shook that thing. He shook that structure that had Paul and Silas incarcerated. It wasn't just necessarily a physical structure. There was a spiritual structure that had him in that situation. And God wants us to understand there are spiritual structures that come and try to incarcerate us and try to hold us back and limit us from becoming all that he's called us to be. But it's up to us as an individual and as a corporate body, whatever the situation is, it's up to us to get a hold of the Word of God and let it get inside of us and feed on it until that thing builds and comes to the measure that it's bigger than any opposition that could ever come against you. And that's what pleases God. So see, God, you, you could say, boy, God's probably really kind of aggravated at you, the life that you lived. And, you know, even sharing that testimony, sometimes people will cop an attitude and they'll say, oh, you're a, you're a loser. You know, even though you're serving God, maybe it was 20, 30 years ago, some things happened. People sometimes have that mindset. They allow that thing because they've never really matured themselves. They never, never really understood how God uh, you know, every one of us have had issues that separated us. In other words, we've all had fallen shorts. Amen? The Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. So it doesn't matter how far your shorts fail. They all fail. Amen? And so uh, people will sometimes begin to try to put you in a, in a, in a mindset in their mind, or the enemy does, he comes along and, and tries to put you or form you. But the thing that, that impresses God is not what you've done as far as how bad you've been or what kind of life you've lived. What impresses God is the faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. Even in Ephesians 6, where it talks about the weapons of our warfare, the scripture says above all, 
take the shield of faith. Above everything else, take the shield of faith, whereby you're able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so it's important that we understand that without faith, it's impossible to please God. God can take you from your pit to your palace by faith. It's faith in his word. It's trusting his word. But see, the enemy comes along with these structures. And it may be a structure of rebellion. It may be a structure of the fact that you're not educated enough. It may be a structure of, of, of uh, you know, maybe you feel like you're not tall enough or you're, you're too short, you're too tall, whatever the case may be. There's all kind of structures that the enemy tries to put on us as individuals. But I want you to know today that those structures are just lies of the enemy. That God has a vision for you as a people and you have to determine to shake loose from the things that are trying to structurally hold you down and hold you back. It's the, when, when, when the scripture tells us that there is absolutely nothing impossible with God, you can believe that. We serve a God that cannot lie. He cannot lie. He will not lie. If he said it, he will do it. And so in 1997, the Lord began to impress on me to start a church in Moulton, Texas. I'd never heard of Moulton before. I actually overheard someone talking about the city of Moulton if they needed a church. And I just thought, well, it, and it just dropped in my spirit. So I began to pray and I asked, you know, where's this city at? And went and looked at it and began to drive around and pray and, and just seek God about it. And, and so um, in 1997, in uh, December the 31st of 1997, we stepped out in faith and started a church in Moulton, Texas. The day we opened the doors. Now, I prayed for probably six months to a year before I did this. I didn't know anybody there. I didn't go over there and hold Bible studies. All I did was I prayed. And I prayed and I prayed. And when we opened the doors, Moulton is only 900 people. But when I opened the doors, we had 35 people come. Wow. Right off the bat. I mean, just, we put it in the paper. We're opening an interdenominational church and boom. But prayer is your foundation. Prayer, if you don't have a prayer life, you don't have a foundation. So whatever you're doing is going to fall. It's going to crumble. So it's vital that you understand that. Prayer is the foundation. It's what God builds upon. The better foundation you lay, the bigger things God can build. And so uh, I had a good prayer life. I understood the, the necess necessity of prayer. And so um, just things begin to... to uh, when I, when I went to start the church there, I told the Lord, I said, no, Lord, I'm working for the county, and the county does not pay much. I think it was like uh, $9 an hour, and it came out to about 23000 a year. And I said, if you are really wanting me to go and start this church, Lord, you're going to have to open a door for a better job. And so about two days later, I was going through Luling, and my cousin worked for the railroad, and he's passing by on the track, and I stopped and talked to him. And he said, hey, if you know anybody that's interested in going to work for the railroad, they're hiring. And I had no clue about the railroad, nothing whatsoever. I didn't know anything about the wages, or benefits, or anything. And so I said, well, what are they starting out at? And he said, I think it's $7 an hour. And I was like, oh, that can't be God, because that's going down. That's not going up. And so... I thought, well, you know, I've been praying about a job. It's worth going on down for the interview. So I went down, and they interviewed, and they said, you know, we start you at 13-something an hour, and they talked about all the benefits and everything. And those old mindsets tried to kick back in, and I said, I've got to have this job. So, you know, the old skills, the lies. So it says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? So I'm thinking, how can I word this? so that I can get this job. And so it, it, I didn't really just come out and lie, but I wasn't telling the truth either. And so there were three phases we had to go through. And so after that first phase, we broke for lunch. 
No, the second phase. We, we, did, we did the first phase where we filled out the paperwork, and they told us, they said, we do a very thorough background check on you. If you're lying about anything, you're, you're going to be terminated, so you might as well tell the truth. And then we had to go through a physical endurance thing. And so I passed those two, and I went to lunch. And I'm just walking, and the Holy Spirit, it's like he was behind me with a whip. He said, I told you I don't need your stinking flesh involved. I'm going to give you this job, and you don't need to try to be doing all of this stuff. And, and so I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to make it straight. I'm going to make it straight. So I went back, and we go through the final phase, and out of 35 people, I, I was one of the ones they hired. And so I, I go out to the car, and I got in the car, and I backed out, and he said, you're not going to tell them the truth, are you? I said, yes, I'm going to tell them the truth. So I made it around the block, and I pulled back in. And I went inside, and I said, listen, I don't know if you guys are Christians or not. I said, but I am a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and I'm under heavy conviction right now. And I said, this job is not that important to me. I need to make it straight. I said, I lied to you on this application uh, I said, I, I, I explained to him, I said, I kind of did a white lie or I twisted it to where, you know, I could, I could live with it, but the Holy Spirit couldn't. So I said, I'm back here. And if you need to hire somebody else, hire somebody else. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? You're the kind of person we're looking for. We don't have to worry about you stealing from us, lying to us, cheating on your time sheets and all that. He said, you know, we're going to make notation on your application that you told us about this stuff and you enjoy your career. So, not only am I an uneducated in, in, in as far as a 10th grade education, and, I, you know, and, and people sometimes will tell me, you know, I just can't believe you only have a 10th grade education. I tell them, you know, I, I didn't say that I'm, I'm, I'm ignorant. I said I'm stupid. You know, I, I made some stupid mistakes, but I'm relatively intelligent, you know. And so... Um, I've been working for Union Pacific Railroad for 19, uh, 18 years, going on my 19th year now. And God has just blown me away by some of the things. I mean, the managers and directors would come to me and say, we want you to take this position. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, y'all don't understand. I don't even have a 10th grade education. Y'all want me to be a track inspector and know the geometry of the track and, and all of this stuff. But God... And it's only by the grace of God. So I was a track inspector for six years and never had a derailment. The Holy Spirit would tell me sometimes if there were things that were not right, and I would, I would correct them. He'd let me know. And, and uh, so where we don't measure up in the natural, the Holy Spirit measures us up. It's kind of like the, the Holy Spirit revealed this to me or showed me this one day. He said, I want you to understand my grace is like a backup generator. You don't have to depend on it until you get in a situation to where you don't measure up. For example, right now, all the lights are working fine, but if they should go out, then you need the generator to kick on and begin to light the building again. But you don't just run on the generator all the time. You operate on the, on the normal until you get in a situation where you need the supernatural. So the grace of God is that supernatural ability, that supernatural power that comes and kicks in and measures you up when you don't feel like you measure up. Or when society or man's degree doesn't say you measure up. And so, uh, you know, some of the old habits and things, it, it, it takes, that's why you need the Holy Spirit. That's why you need the baptism because he comes in and he begins to show you areas. When I was released from prison, I was on mandatory supervision. They said, you will not drive a car at all. Not, not, it didn't have anything to do if I was drinking. You will not drive a car at all. And you will not drink at all. And if you are caught doing either one of these things, you will go directly back to prison. You won't even go to court. And so, I was still a baby Christian, so I still get over into reasoning. So I decided, you know, I have to get back and forth to work. God knows that. 
And so I said, I'll just drive myself back and forth to work and trust God to watch out for me. And so that was going fine, but then, you know, we always take it a little bit further. When, when we do something, when, when, we, when the enemy gets us to do something, it's just enough to get us enslaved. See, if we yield to him just a little bit, he, he, he gets a grip on us. And so then I thought, well, you know, I've been doing pretty good, and, and me and a friend of mine, we went hunting, and uh, we're coming back through town, and I knew every now and then my taillights on the car would go off. But when they went off, the dash lights would also go off. And so I had this little strategy, you know, I'll keep an eye. If I seen a police officer, I'd keep an eye on my dash lights. If they went off, I'd just touch my brake so that they didn't see. Well, that, that little thing failed, and here comes the police officer, and he stopped me. And I said, well, I don't have my uh, license and insurance with you, but I can give you my name and date of birth. So without even thinking, I gave him my brother's name and date of birth. It had been just such a habit in my life of doing, you know, that kind of stuff. But I got home and all oh, the Holy Spirit was just, just chewing on me. And I was like, but God, don't you understand? They said I'm going back to prison. And, and so this little battle's raging. And finally I said, okay, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to do what's right. So I told my friend that I was staying with, I said, Al, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. I said, but I've got to go down there and tell these people the truth. And I said, it, you know, it's already in the writing. It's, uh, I don't even go to court. I'm going back to prison. I said, but I've got to make this right. And he said, I was wondering if this Christianity thing you were talking about was real or not. And he said, I'll, I'll, come on, I'll take you down there. I said, hold on now. Don't be in such a hurry here. <laughs> Let's talk about this. So anyway, Al takes me down there, and I go in, and I tell the lady, I said, I need to see the judge. And she said, well, the judge is not in today, but uh, maybe I can, maybe it's something I can help you with. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm sure I need to see the judge. And she said, well, just tell me about it, son. And so I said, <laughs> I gave her my little spiel. I said, well, I don't know if you're a Christian or not, but I'm a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. And I said, I just got out of prison and I'm not supposed to drink, and I'm not supposed to drive at all. And I said, I was driving, and I was caught. I gave my brother's name and date of birth. And I said, I need to make this thing right, because I'm under a heavy Holy Ghost conviction right now. And she said, I think you're right. You need to see the judge. <laughs> but she said, I'm going to tell you this. She said, you have renewed my faith in humanity, because you're willing to come and make this thing right, knowing the consequences that you're going to suffer. And so the, I came back a few days later and I seen a judge and, and it wasn't the original judge I was going to see. It was a different one. And this judge said, I need to talk to the city attorney about this and you have to come back. So long story short, uh, they said anybody that's willing to try to make this, you know, that's willing to come forward like this deserves another chance. So they, they just threw the thing out and gave me another chance and, and I stopped doing all of that stuff. I said, you know, I said to myself, self, it's enough of this. And so, but God is faithful. He, and so what I want you to understand, God wasn't up there looking at me like, you, you heathen? God was up there saying, come on, I know you can do it. Come on, I know you can step out in faith and make this thing right. Come on, I know that, I know that you know that I can get you through this. And, and God was cheering me on. He was never pushing me down. He was never beating me up. He was never crucifying me. He was saying, I know that you can do this. Come on, come on, you know, get in my word. Look at what I've said. See that I'm a faithful God. And so I did, and so... Since then, God has been taking me places. Uh, I go to Africa uh, usually once a year and minister, and uh, it's it's just mind-boggling. You know, I I never would have thought that with being a high school dropout and being a criminal and having all the strikes against me that I had that God would still use me. But God would send me to Africa, and I get over there in Africa, and you know, you're driving down these old beat up roads, and here's this big billboard, and you look up, and there's your picture on the billboard. You're saying, Whoa, look at me, mama. <laughs> you know, if mama can see me now. Um, 
But God has been so faithful. And, and so the thing that, the only thing that causes us, the Bible says that he takes us from faith to faith, from glory to glory. It's him working, both the willing to do of his good pleasure in each one of us. And so um, back in um, September, I think it was September, uh, I'm on Facebook and there's a, a lady in um, Columbia. I've never met the people or anything, but she sent me a message and she said, my daughter, I, I couldn't even understand everything she was saying because she doesn't speak English. And so she was telling me that her daughter had been diagnosed with this disease. And she said, she's in the hospital and it's very serious. And she said, if you have a cure in your country, please send it. Please get the cure and send it. And, and I, I heard the desperation of her cry. Because, you know, the other countries look to America like, because we are superior in a sense. I mean, we've advanced so much more than the other countries, other than maybe Israel. But uh, she was thinking, if there is an answer in the earth, it's in America. And so I said, I have the cure. He lives inside me. And so God, just out of compassion, I mean, just, I mean, I, I seen this email one week and I called my boss. I said, can I have off Monday and Tuesday? And he said, well, we got this, we got that. You know, if it's something you really need, I said, yeah, it's something I really need to do. So he said, okay, yeah, go ahead. So I booked a flight to Columbia. Flew out on Saturday to, to return on Tuesday. And so I'm going over there and I don't know these people. I don't know a thing in the world about them. I know that they can't speak English, and I can't speak Spanish. And uh, so I'm on the plane, and there, there's this Colombian guy sitting beside me. And I really don't even know that much about Colombia. I know that a lot of that, those countries are under the, the cartels and things of that nature, but I really never gave any of it a thought. This, this, this compassion in me for this young lady was just overwhelming. And so that was all I could think of. I've got to go over there and take her the cure. And so I'm on the plane and this guy's sitting there and I said, uh, so are you from Columbia? And he said, yeah. He said, uh, I've been in America for six months. He said, I came to take English, learn English. And so he said, well, what brings you to Columbia? I said, well, there's this, this Facebook friend that uh, she said her daughter is got a disease of some kind and in terrible condition and and she just asked me if we had the cure and I said you know I, I do I have the cure I said his name is Jesus and so I'm just going over there to to bring the cure and he's just kind of looking at me you know he's about 18 he's kind of looking at me like I'm crazy and he said do you know these people I said well we've been Facebook friends probably for a couple of years and he says but do you know anybody over there I mean, do you know, know anybody over there? I said, no, I don't. He said, do they speak English? I said, no. He said, don't you think this is rather dangerous? I said, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. Don't be putting thoughts in my mind. <laughs> I said, I never really thought about it. I said, but I know I've got to do it. I've got the cure. I've got to take it. I've got to take the cure to her. And he just kind of looked at me and he said, he said, wow. He said, that's, you know, thank you. Thank you for, for, you know, because a lot of countries, they feel like when you're doing something like that, th their country is very appreciative. Uh, Africa's a lot, the African nations are a lot like that. So anyway, I get over there and I'm thinking, okay, this guy's, his mom is a judge. And I'm thinking, well, I've got some contacts, you know, and I'm, I'm in my mind thinking how God's going to connect all this stuff. So when I landed, I said, uh, because I didn't have a cell service over, I said, can you send them a text and tell them that I'm here and find out where I meet them at or whatever. And so he sends a text and they said, we're waiting at the coffee shop, you know, what are you wearing? And I said, well, I got a ball cap on that says Texas. It should be pretty easy to recognize me. <clears throat> so I get in there and uh, meet them and they're, nya, 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 you know, in Spanish. And I'm like, no comprendi. <laughs> 
but thank God for Google Translate. So they got, the, they got the Google Translate out, and they began to talk into it, and then I could understand. So anyway, long story short, the next day, I said, I want to pray for your daughter tomorrow. So the next day, uh, they came to the hotel, and what it was, she had been diagnosed with, diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and it had begun to uh, attack her immune system, and now... Uh, her immune system, in turn, began to attack the, the bones and the joints, and it was deteriorating, uh, and also her vital organs. And so uh, I said, I want to pray for your daughter tomorrow. So they came to the hotel and just sat across the table, and, and we're just talking. And, you know, it, it was, it's just, when I look back, it's kind of crazy. But I just took the anointing all out, and I said, okay, I'm going to pray now. And I put the oil on her head, and I just took her by the hands. And immediately a demon began to manifest. And for probably five minutes, you know, I told the thing, no, you've got to go. And all of a sudden, it leaves, and she's just, she's weeping. And she raises up, and she just goes, she says, it's all gone. She just started doing both hands. She said, all the pain is gone. And she said, I have felt so far from God. I felt like God didn't love me. I, felt, I tried to go to church. I tried to do the things, but something kept me back. And she said, it's gone. And she was so excited and so liberated just by the Spirit of God. And, and so they said, um, and they're very poor. You know, most of Colombians are very poor. And they didn't even want me to see their home because it was poor. And... Um, so I said, I want to pray in your home. And they were like, well, maybe the last day you can pray in the home before, before you go back. And so, but they had, she, this young lady had a brother. And she wanted me to pray for her, the brother. And he's into darkness. He's into all of this wild music and stuff. And so they wanted me to pray for him. So long story short, they bring him over. Or, or when they finally let me go to the house, I anoint the house and pray over it. The boy comes over. He's about 20, I guess. And... Uh, but he doesn't really want, he's, he's all mixed up. Um, talking about, you know, I just want you to get rid of the negative energy. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to really give my life to Jesus. I just want you to get rid of the negative energy. And I said, well, the negative energy isn't nothing but some demon spirits. And if I get rid of the demon spirits and you don't commit your life to Christ, then seven more is going to come back. You're going to be in a lot worse shape than you started. So you need to decide if you want Jesus or not. So I finally told his sister, I said, tell him your testimony. Tell, her, tell him what God did for you. And so she told him, and his eyes just got big, and, and he started asking her questions. And so then he said, okay, I want you to pray. And so <clears throat> I sat there, and I began to pray for him. I didn't feel anything at all. Even when I prayed for her, I didn't feel anything. So many times we want to walk by feeling what we feel. I didn't feel a thing. I began to pray over him. And, but, but I wanted to video it. So I had my iPad over there, and I told, I told their mother, I said, I want you to video this uh, in case this demon manifests or something, you know, just use it for teaching preferences or whatever in the, it, later. And so she was videoing it, and I'm just over there praying for him. I bind you, devil, you know, and, and, and I'm just going on, and, and I'm thinking, why is nothing manifesting? Why isn't anything happening, you know? And, and the Holy Spirit just whispered to me and said, Rocky, not everything happens the same way. Not every demon is going to manifest the same way. And he said, but when you command it to go, it has to go. And so I, I was like, okay. So I just took authority over the demon of anger. And I said, you foul spirit of anger, you come out of him in the name of Jesus. And... So after it was all done, the mother's trying to tell me, I, I, I want to, you know, and she's, she doesn't speak English, so she's trying to tell me real, in real fast Spanish, because she was all excited, about this blue light she kept seeing. And I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about, you know. So the evening I was leaving, that night, they came by the hotel, and they, she said, look at the video. So I do the video. And as I'm praying, you see a blue light. Every time I'm, Robocoshiki, you see a blue light just like a glow going out but the neat thing was when I rebuked this this demon of anger I said you foul demon of anger I command you to come out in the name of Jesus you see this out of the right side of him just a, like a poof just leave him I mean immediately and uh 
they, the, the boy was delivered and, and they said he wants to start holding Bible studies and stuff in the mornings at home and, you know, doing, doing good things. But what, what I want you to understand is uh, uh, what I really sense the Holy Spirit is saying today is we allow structures to hold us and limit us from being what God has called us to be. There is absolutely nothing impossible with God. You carry something greater inside of you than the atomic bomb, than the nuclear weapon. There's something more powerful in you than what you really understand and realize. But there are these satanic structures that try to hold us back. And as I was praying this past week, uh, after Pastor Mills told me I, was, I would be here today, as I was praying, uh, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and he said, there is a, there's an individual at this church that, is, that has um, unforgiveness. There's something that happened, and they have unforgiveness. And he said, they have stepped out from under my protection. They've stepped out from under my covering because they have yielded to that structure of the enemy. Now, the one that the Lord was telling me about in particular was a lady. He said, there's a woman there. Doesn't mean that there's just one person. There may be many people. But this is a satanic structure that the enemy has come and placed over you. Because when, see, here's the thing. The blood of Jesus, when God looks at us from heaven, the blood of Jesus covers us. It's like a, this vast a pair of glasses and when God looks through it he doesn't see us like we see ourselves when man looks at you they see all the issues they look at you from the outside but when God looks he looks at the transformed heart he sees the finished work and so what happens is the enemy and there's only two things really that can take us out from under that covering and it's idolatry and rebellion and rebellion, and, and unforgiveness is rebellion because if God forgave us, and he says it's a commandment, if somebody sins against you seven times 70, you forgive them that many times in a day. And so if we feel inside that we are holding something against someone, and we need to let it go, but we just feel justified in doing that, we've come under the structure of the enemy. We've come under his grip. We've come under a deception. And God wants to break that deception today and free you up. And so it doesn't make any difference to me if it's one person or everybody here. If you feel, if you sense inside, that's something the enemy has been trying to do to me or has done to me. Then I want to ask you to come forward and I want to pray for you this morning and get you freed up from that. Because God cannot take you to where he wants to take you when you're under the structure of the enemy. Amen? Amen. And so, that's, that's the number one thing, is that God wants to free you up from structures of the enemy. And um, God has such a, a love and compassion for every one of us. And like I said, when he looks at us, he doesn't look at us the way we look at ourselves. He looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ. But when we step out from under the blood and try to hold on to things that we ought not to hold on to, it limits us and it hinders us and it hinders what God can do. So today, if that's you and you feel like you have unforgiveness or you feel like you've fallen under the structure of the enemy somehow or another, not saying you're a wicked person, not saying anything bad, just saying if you feel like that's you and you want me to pray with you today, I want to invite you to come down now and I want to go ahead and pray. Do we have oil? you have any anointing oil? Praise God. We thank you, Lord. Those of you that you feel like you're okay with God and all, I want you just to softly pray as we just are being sensitive to the Holy Spirit here this morning. 
ki rambonde di 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 ashe ki karoto to 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 We thank you, Lord Jesus. Kibrabata shate di 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 a to do 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 di di a she ki kara de 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 brokonde. Ivronde di 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 a shukura bara kashi te di 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 a shata ta da 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 di a te. Holy Spirit, I release you to go into this vessel and undo what the enemy has done. I break this structure. I break it. I break it right now in Jesus' name. Satan, loose her and let her go free right now. Let her go free right now. Ivronde de 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 bokoshe ki kara da da de de ande. Vroko tokoshe ki ata. Ibraka tashi te de de atobra konde. Dibri, Father, these that have come this morning have come to acknowledge that maybe. There was a structure that took hold of them, and they want to repent and release that thing. So today, Father God, we just say we release it in Jesus' name. We release it to you. We release it to you. We release it in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Father, for health, health, health being restored right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for bones. Ibroko takasha ta ta de di a te de di di a tokura bata being made whole. I thank you, Father God. Ibroko te ki a shakara de di a re ibroko te. Ibron de de di a shata. I thank you, Father, for releasing this young lady from the grip of the enemy, setting her free, Lord, to be able to run. And not be weary to walk and not faint. Ivroko takashi te kiara brokote. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Ivrambon de 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 bokura kashata. No more Satan. No more. No more. No more torment. No more torment. Ivroko takashi ki kiara brokote kiate. Ara de 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 boche be di ata, ibron de 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 di a shakara de de di ate, ibron de 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 breaki kara de di a shata, ibron de 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 di a sheki kara de 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 di ande. I want y'all to pray this prayer with me, Father God. Right now, I make a choice decision. To release the past and everyone that's hurt me, everyone that's wounded me, everyone that's spoken evil against me, I forgive them. I release them. Lord, people that have disappointed me, I forgive and release them. I give them over into your hands, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me for holding on to things that were not of God. I thank you, Lord, that you set me free today. In the name of Jesus. Every lie, every lie of the enemy. Every lie of the enemy, I break its power right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, and I ask you, Father, to give her a fresh infilling of your Spirit. Ibroko takashi ki kara de ibroko tokora badiashi. Hobra katande de ibre ki kara de diboshi. Ibrondo do 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 dia ta kara dia shiki arabrande. And I make a choice decision today, Father, not to take up this anymore. Not to take it up anymore after this day. I lay it at your feet and I leave it there, Lord God, in Jesus' name. 
In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Iroko to kasha kara de de breki kara de boshe ki kara de ronde de de boshe. And I ask you Father God to stir in her a faith vision. Lord it will take her from where she's at to where she desires to be. Stir up, stir up, stir up that faith vision in her, oh God, that will take her from where she's at to where you desire her to be. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I come against the opposition right now in Jesus' name. And I say you must lay prostrate. You must lay prostrate. All opposition must lay, lay prostrate. And I give you the glory, praise, and honor, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you have good things in store. Good things, good things, good things. So God's restoring your joy. He's restoring your hope. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Lord God, for the work that you're doing. I break all confusion of the enemy off of your mind right now in Jesus' name. All confusion be broken off of your mind right now in Jesus' name. To think God thoughts, to think God's thoughts, to think God thoughts. That you would be able to think God thoughts. Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus and I command you, spirit of confusion, loose your hold from her and let her go free. Let her go free. Let her go free in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, God, that you're a God of a turnaround. You turn things around for your glory. Turn things around for her good and for your glory. So I thank you, Father, for the turnaround. Thank you for the turnaround. Thank you for the turnaround. And I see much fruit coming forth. It's almost like a freshly planted garden and, and things are just beginning to green up. Things are beginning to green up and there's coming forth a harvest. So I thank you, Father. I thank you that you're at work in her. God wants you to know that He is at work in you. He is using you. Stop beating yourself up. Stop being so hard on yourself. For it's the faith that you step out in that pleases me, saith the Lord. And I just hear the Lord saying, there's safety in a multitude of counselors. There's safety in a multitude of counselors. There's something you're not sure about. Step out into the, and just seek counsel. Seek counsel. Seek counsel. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Father, we say enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Father, I thank you for bringing new acquaintances into her life. I thank you for bringing new individuals into her life, Lord. Individuals of reputable character, individuals, Lord God, that, that know you, that walk with you, that love you, that care about you, and that will care about her. Father, I thank you for 
So I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord, that as she lets go of the old and lays hold of the new, Father, you have new things in store, new, new things. Behold, I do a new thing. So you must forget and release those individuals of the past, those, those uh, even, situ even relationships. I don't know if it's a, it's a relationship between you and a man or if it's just relationships of friends, but I see there's a relationship that needs to be severed for God to take you to where he wants to take you. So we break the strategy of the enemy off of your life right now. We break these evil structures. We command them to crumble right now in Jesus' name. And though it may look like you don't know how you can make it, and though you may wonder how in the world is it going to happen, it's going to happen by faith. It's, you're going to make it by faith. So I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father that you see the very sparrow that falls from the sky. There's not one that goes unseen. There's not a hair of her head that you're not aware of, Lord God. You're a big God. You're a big God and you have big plans for her. So Lord, we release the old. We say we forgive and we let go. We let go in Jesus' name. <speaking> in <Hebrew> So, Lord, I ask you now to give her eyes, vision, vision for her eyes, Lord. Not, not her natural eyes so much, Lord, but her spiritual eyes, that she would begin to see, Lord God, in, in, in the Spirit, see where you want to take her, see what you want to do. So I release fresh oil over her, fresh Holy Spirit oil over her right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. I break off diseases off of your physical body right now in Jesus' name. I break diseases off of you right now in Jesus' name. You're whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I break all witchcraft off of you in Jesus' name. And I just ask you, Lord, to saturate her in your blood. Wash her, wash her, wash her in your blood right now. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you in Jesus' name. There's an evangelistic anointing on your life. There's an anointing on you to, to share this good news, to preach. And, and I see God is going to be taking you into places that that you would never dream, you would have never thought him, uh, imaginable. But God is going to begin to take you into places. And you say, but how? What will I say? What will I do? God will speak through you. God will give you what you need to say. So the Lord wants you to know that you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. The past is gone. It's over with. It's released. And I just lay hands upon you right now and I stir up the gifts and callings of God in you. And I just, I just, just uh, declare that there is an evangelistic anointing in you. There's an evangelistic anointing in you. And you have to understand that the power is not, it's not about you. It's in you. It's the power of Christ. It's the Spirit of Christ in you. It's the Spirit of Christ, the hope of glory in you. And there will be those that will reject you. There will be those that will will come against you but you need to know that God is for you and that this is a God thing that God has ordained you he's called you for a time such as this to step out to step out and begin to
to be a mouthpiece for him, to begin to tell about the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the anointing of God that can change situations. I see you going into situa in, in the areas where there's drug addiction and, and, and things of that nature, and God's going to begin to use you to set the captives free. So take time to lay that foundation in prayer. Take time to lay the foundation in prayer. And then step out and watch God. Watch Him move. Watch Him heal. Watch Him deliver. Watch Him restore. In the name of Jesus. And I thank you for it, Lord. All of those structures crumble right now in Jesus' name. All of those structures crumble right now. I break this stress. I break this spirit that's tried to oppress and stress you. I break its power off of you. Loose her in Jesus' name and let her go free. Let her go free. I break this weight off of your shoulders in Jesus' name. This was not intended for you to carry. The anointing of God destroys yokes and removes burdens. And I hear the Lord saying, Am I not the all-seeing God? God? Do I not see all things? Do I not know of those family members that, that are struggling, of those family members that are in, in need of a touch from me? For I know them. I have my hand upon them. I'm dealing with them. I'm calling them. So don't carry the weight. Don't carry the burden of that thing. Release it. Release it. Release it. For this is my burden to carry, saith the Lord. So Father, I speak peace over her nervous system. I speak peace, Lord God, over her body, every muscle, cell, tissue, fiber, fluid. I command you to be at peace in Jesus' name. So we thank you, Father, for fresh anointing, fresh oil, fresh anointing, fresh oil, fresh anointing, fresh oil. And there's a strong gift of counsel in you, strong gift of counsel in you. But the enemy comes in with these structures and he tries to infiltrate and and get our counsel off course and everything. But we break that structure today. And we say that godly counsel flows out of you. Godly counsel flows out of you. Let it not be tainted with the flesh, but let it flow from that river of life within you. So we thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. And God's going to use you to curse the root of bitterness in many, many people's lives. It's going to use you to curse the root of bitterness. They're going to come and say, you know, so-and-so did this or said this, and you're going to say, hold on, let's curse that thing at the root right now. Let's put a, let's put a stop to that thing right now. We're going to curse it at the root. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. How are you feeling? Praise God. Open your hand. Work them. Work them. 
God's healing power is on you. You work on it. Amen. Father, we ask you for increase. Increase. By faith, you begin to open and close those hands. You're going to come out of this chair. You're going to run and not be weary. You're going to walk and not faint. You're going to be a great testimony for God. So, Lord, we break the grip of the enemy fresh and new. I want you to understand something that God is doing. There was a man in the Bible by the name of Mephibosheth, and he was a cripple. He had, they had dropped him as a baby. But he was either a son or a grandson to Jonathan, who David had made a covenant with. And David, when he was king and he was sitting around his table, he said, are there, are there any descendants left of Jonathan? Because I made a covenant with Jonathan. And they said, well, we think there's, they think there's this one, there's this cripple. And they went and he said, go get him. And they brought him. And he's like, what would you have to do with a dog like me? But I want you to understand something. What's, what God wants you to understand today is that you are in covenant with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And He's bringing you out of your cripple place and He's going to set you at His table. Amen? He's bringing you out. So it's done. As far as God's concerned, it's done. And don't be surprised when you wake up in the morning if you don't just jump up out of bed. Amen? Because it's going to happen. Hallelujah. So Father, we thank You today. We thank You today. And, and I, I don't know people here, I feel like in my spirit everybody's probably saved, but if there's anybody and you don't know Jesus and you want to make Jesus Lord of your life today, I want to invite you to come down and do that before we close out. Anybody at all, you say, yeah, brother, pray for me. I'm not a Christian. I'm not saved. Maybe you're backslidden. Anybody at all? Everybody good with God? Hallelujah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, praise God. It's... Uh, honor to be here today and uh, we're standing in agreement with you guys for God to put the person here that he wants you to have that's going to flow that's going to that's going to take you guys where God wants to take you and uh, we're excited thank you for having me today it's been a blessing and uh, look forward to just seeing the fruit of what God brings out of all of this amen praise God Wow. You know, we all have different places we've been and different places we've uh, experienced. And it was good to hear it from a different point of view and the word that we were touching.